Academica Media. From Academica Media Studios in Miami, Florida, it's Big Ideas in Education, a weekly recap of inspiration and innovation in your schools. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Big Ideas in Education. I am Sarah Belos Five from Somerset Academy Schools, joined, of course, by my co-host, Ryan Carell of Doral College. Hi, Ryan. Of, of course. Yes. Good to talk to you, Sarah. Happy holidays. Happy holidays and happy holidays to all of you out there. Uh, we are actually, uh, you know, excited because this is our last show of 2021. We'll be taking a little break um, for uh, the new year and we'll, we'll see you guys. I believe our next show will be January 11th. So it's going to be a few weeks, you know, if everybody can handle a little break. <laughs> I know we all could use a little rest and we hope you all have a, you know, very restful, nice break. Well, we're certainly looking forward to the R and R around here, but we're gonna miss all the listeners, right? This is absolutely. Oh, but oh. I think it's good. You know, I think it's in this like hustle and bustle. It's good to just reflect and rest a little bit. And I know that you have something you want to talk about. And we both un, you know, unplanned brought some holiday stories today. So let's hear it. Yeah. Well, there's no shortage of holiday-related education news and stories out there. We got a couple great ones this week. Uh, definitely an eye-opening one that came out of the We Are Teachers blog. Let me tell you a little bit about it, Sarah. So as we approach our winter break in schools, many of us take it as a given that all of our students are happily welcoming the extended time off. But one teacher and author reminds us that not all of our students are necessarily looking forward to time away from school and that we should be sensitive to that fact. In the We Are Teachers blog on December 15th, educator and author Trevor Muir has some powerful words about what the extended holiday break can mean for some kids. And I'm just going to read the first paragraph here for you because I think he does a better job of summarizing it than I ever would. <laughs> One year during the weeks leading up to the winter break, I asked my students to write about what they plan to do during their time off. Most wrote things like see my cousins, get a new gaming system, and go skiing. However, one of my students turned in a blank piece of paper with just his name on it. When I asked him why he didn't write anything, he reluctantly told me that he wasn't excited for the break. He said all winter break meant to him was two weeks at home alone while his mother was passed out on the couch. No tree, no family dinners, not even any presents. It was in this moment that I realized that not all students look forward to these extended breaks from school. While most kids and teachers flee from school gleefully on the last day, many students like this one dread the break from school. They miss the structure of the school day, the stability of the classroom, the presence of friends, the food in the cafeteria, and the love their teachers give them. So now in this blog post, Mr. Mule tells us that while we can't change the home circumstances of our students, we can take steps to help ease their stress going into the holiday season. The article suggests that, for example, when talking to your students about the break, avoid questions like, who's excited for break? Or, what are you going to get for Christmas or Hanukkah? And instead, opt for more neutral statements like, what are your plans for the break? Or, what is one way that you can help someone in the next couple weeks? Mr. Muir also recommends that teachers be a listening ear for students who are feeling anxious about the coming break, and even to work with guidance counselors to connect students with resources to help make the holidays more manageable. Now, I'll tell you, Sarah, this is my own privilege talking, but... Before I read this article, it would have never occurred to me that this yeah. might be a, a hindrance for students, that this is, but it seems obvious now that, you know, obviously the holidays can be a stressful time for grownups. And so why wouldn't it be for students as well? And certainly I feel inclined to opt for this more kind of sensitive language with my students going forward. Absolutely. I think it's a good reminder. And it, it also makes me think about some things that I think have become a lot more common language since the pandemic started, which is that, you know, not every kid is sitting at home playing video games having a good time right absolutely not we have a lot of kids who depend on the resources that school provides socially and physically um, we've said it before on the show but we absolutely have students who the only meals they are, can count on are the meals that they get at school and so it is not a given that they're all excited to go home over holiday break to to spend time um, with whoever is available, you know, and, and sometimes the parents of our students 
don't have the opportunity to take breaks also, right? So some people yeah. think of holiday breaks as like, great, the family gets to be all together. But most parents are working, as we saw during the pandemic, too. It's a very stressful time for parents when their kids are at home and they don't have maybe reliable child care. They can't spend time with them. Um, so I think it's a good reminder to, that our experiences and our students' experiences are obviously very diverse and varied, and we need to take that into consideration and make sure that we're providing opportunities for them to express themselves. But I love the mention of you know keeping an ear up for kids who may be having a tough time and getting counselors involved because absolutely there are a lot of families that are hurting still very, very much this year, and we need to make sure that we as educators are providing whatever resources we can to help, you know, soften that that blow. Yeah. And if we're going to keep an ear out, as you said, and really take the lessons of this article to heart, I think what it really represents is just a mind shift that needs to happen throughout the school campus. I think as you get closer to the holidays, and certainly this is the case in lots of workplaces, there's this inclination to kind of want to take your hands off the wheel a little bit, coast into the coming holiday and just welcome the time off. But what really this article suggests is that at schools, this is the time where we need to be the most vigilant. This is the time where we need to have our counselors and our teachers working overtime, uh, keeping our ears open to make sure that all of our students are ready to transition into this extended time off. They're getting the attention they need. They're getting the resources they need so that we know that they're going to be safe and okay during this time and ready to come back in the new year, uh, ready to come back to the supportive environment. Absolutely. Well, I know you have a, a holiday story for us as well, Sarah, to keep this, uh, this, uh, these good tidings going. Absolutely. I came across a really interesting article this week that, that really made me smile. I think a lot of us as educators, and especially when we're classroom teachers, want to do something fun for the holidays in the classroom, whether it's a special activity or you know maybe reading something special or, or doing a service project or something like that. And I found some educational holiday traditions from around the world, which I thought were really interesting. I did not know about a lot of these. Um, the first one, I'm going to do my best to pronounce this, but it's the Christmas book flood in Iceland, which they call Yola Boca Flord, uh, according to a pronunciation guide on YouTube, <laughs> um, which I had How many times of. were you practicing that in front of the mirror I, before this episode? I even typed it out phonetically so that I could say that. Um, well done. Yes. Thank you. Our in Icelandic winter... <laughs> listeners are pleased, I'm sure. I hope so. In wintry Iceland, families always give books to each other on Christmas Eve and then plan on spending the night reading. Sign me up for that. I'll tell you, that seems yeah. like the kind of cozy holiday I would love, um, which is a really interesting um, tradition. So uh, talking to them about, you know, what kinds of books, what you would like to read about. And also, I think there's something absolutely lovely about when we're talking about a really hectic time of year to just, oh, no, we're just going to, you know, get in our cozy pajamas and read sign me up like i said <laughs> in finland um christmas time is seen as a time to reflect on family with customs that include taking time to visit grave sites of departed family members and teaching younger family members about departed relatives which is really interesting so this is more about like families getting together and talking about their own family history it kind of takes me back to you know when we're in elementary school writing out our family trees and yeah. i don't think i would have ever associated that with the holiday season um in australia they use writing letters to santa as a handwriting and writing exercise so they do this at school they do this at home um, the australia post even has step-by-step -step santa letter writing guides including downloaded downloadable lesson plans and templates um, which is really adorable um, doing advent calendars in school where they practice counting and having little games and toys and candies. Um, here's an interesting one that I never would have associated with the holidays, learning CPR. Why is CPR important? Well, in Australia and on the other side of the globe, right, it is uh, winter time, of course, here in the northern hemisphere, but in the southern hemisphere, it's the middle of summer. Oh, or yeah. So they have uh, like large campaigns talking about um, swimming safety and things like that. Uh, and so Royal Life Saving Australia runs life saving courses all over the country. 
Um, even though you may not think you want to spend your time around Christmas educating yourself about something new, it is an important skill to have as it literally could save a life. And that's really interesting. Um, and some other fun things include New Year's predictions or New Year's resolutions, which I know I've done many, many times as an educator, and um, learning about cookies cookies and holiday treats. Um, it provides really fun opportunities for measurement and things like that. Um, there's a tradition in France, uh, a it says a traditional Provençal French Christmas. Families create 13 separate Christmas desserts, which sounds, again, you know, sign me up for some of these. We get desserts <laughs> and baking and we get uh, books. I, I think these are absolutely adorable. And if you're, you know, thinking of fun ways to spend the holidays with your family or just provide a little bit of a fun learning while you're taking a little break, I think that this is a really wholesome way to spend it. So I'm going to share the link to this. It has even more suggestions from all over the world. Um, but it's nice to hear what other people are doing. And of course, I know in the United States, we don't actually have you know, Christmas in schools, we have all sorts, you know, try to represent all sorts of holidays in schools, but it's really interesting to see how other people around the world are celebrating this time. Uh, I love it. And, you know, I'm, I'm with you on a, a whole holiday uh, about reading and getting comfortable. I'm, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't more excited about any holiday that's the uh, tradition that's involving candy and cookies. That's where I'm, <laughs> that's where I'm gravitating towards even more, but these are all great holidays. And as we often say on this show, Sarah, we don't share the stories before we do the show. Like, no, we're completely we don't. surprised by each other's stories. But I can't help but find the parallels in these two stories. In the first story, we're 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 talking about teachers that are looking for substitutes for mm -hmm. ways to acknowledge the holidays with your students that are other other than just hey, what are you getting for Christmas? Because that can be very insensitive. Or what are you getting for the holidays? Because that can be very insensitive, but I think maybe we should be taking our cues from some of our friends around the world and uh, explore some of these other educational traditions that might be used as a supplement to just talk about gifts and things like that. Uh, using it as an opportunity for boosting our reading skills, boosting our writing skills, finding ways to get closer to family. There's a, there's a lot of uh, good lessons to be learned by our international friends that we can absorb over the holidays in our schools. I agree. And I think that um, anytime that we as educators share traditions, whether they're our own traditions or others, it does provide a learning opportunity, but it opens the door for our students to think about, well, what are traditions that we have, whether what's represented in my family or in my culture, and what do I want, right? Because this is, I, I have to say, as I get older, I think a lot about the traditions I want to have for my family moving forward, right? And it's always, you know, a bit of a hodgepodge of what I grew up with versus, you know, the culture that I have now, of course, the culture that my parents grew up with, because I'm a child of immigrants, it's not exactly the way that I I grew up because I grew up in the United States and they didn't. And so there's always a, a mix of cultures, which I think is really cool for kids to see and be exposed to. What do other families feel like? What do other people believe in? What are some other things that happen? And then helping them to see, well, what is it that you would like to have for your, your future and for your traditions um, as you grow up? I, I know we were kind of joking before we started the recording that we both grew up here in South Florida and and I really felt disconnected from a lot of the like, you know, holiday movies and things, you know, with like St. Nick on the rooftop and the We chimney. don't get a lot of white Christmases around We don't here. have any white Christmases, you know, <laughs> maybe we're more like the Australian Christmas at the beach. I don't know, but it's not, it's not something I grew up with. And so I felt really disconnected to that idea of like, this is what a happy holiday looks like, right? It looks very different. And so even in jest, when we're talking about how that's not how we grew up, that's not how most of our kids are growing up either, right? So most of us watching these silly, you know, Netflix, Hallmark movies, there's a very idyllic view of what a, a break would look like or what a vacation looks like or what a holiday would look like and helping kids to see like, not only is it okay if you're does not look that way. It's normal for things to not look that way. And let's share what things look like for us. And so, you know, we joke a lot as adults about, you know, the the crazy fights over 
whatever on Thanksgiving, kids are seeing these things as well. So help to normalize what these different experiences look like and help them to kind of verbalize what would you like things to be? I I would, I'm so grateful that we've had so much time together over this past year and I know that Ryan shares that that sentiment and I hope that we've brought some some joy and some uh, inspiration to you this past year we're so looking forward to sharing more with you in 2022 thanks so much for being a part of our year and we hope you have a restful holiday season happy holidays everyone bye The views expressed on the preceding program have been those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect the views of Academica, its clients, staff, affiliates, or advertisers. 